Welcome to Rhonda London Live. On the show today, should the internet be censored? The CRTC has decided to leave the internet alone in terms of regulation, concluding that the laws governing hate material, pornography, and other contentious material are sufficient. You may be shocked and appalled to see what's on the net. In fact, some of the pictures we'll show you this afternoon are extremely graphic and may be shocking to some viewers. But we have edited out the most disturbing scenes. Your kids could be exposed to material that is much more obscene the next time they log on the computer and decide to explore cyberspace. How do you stop the proliferation of hatred on the Internet? Where does the right to free speech end and committing a crime begin? That's the focus today on Rhonda London Live. Don't go away. We're back right after this. Some five years ago, the Simon Wiesenthal Center found about 50 hate sites on the Internet that were significant. Now, there are more than 2,000, and the number keeps growing. The future doesn't look especially promising, given the CRTC's recent decision not to censor the web. With more on this, I'm joined by Saul Littman, the Canadian representative of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Saul Littman is a sociologist turned journalist, historian, and Nazi hunter. He's the author of War Criminal on Trial. Saul Littman, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. It's my pleasure. Why do you suppose there has been such an exponential growth of these hate sites on the Internet? Going back five years ago, you'd be hard-pressed to find one. Now, there are more than 2,000, and the number just keeps growing every day. Well, they, they've been lurking in the woodworks, these hate groups. But generally speaking, over the past 50 years, they've had very little public play because most people tend to disregard them. They were never able to develop large memberships. They didn't raise large amounts of money. If 30 people turned out to one of their neo-Nazi meetings, they considered it a blazing success. And uh, they felt frustrated because the work was hard. Uh, you know, you try to recruit people by putting leaflets under the windshields of, of, of cars in a parking lot, the wind is blowing, the weather is cold, people resent what you're doing. Uh, now they can sit in their basement with a cheap computer and reach millions of people simultaneously and they recognize that this is an enormous breakthrough for them, that now they're able to reach millions of people they were never able to reach before, uh, they're able to talk to each other in semi-privacy, uh, they have a quality of anonymity. Nobody's going to throw a punch at them. And for this reason, uh, the uh, Internet has attracted more and more hate groups who find it a very, very successful venue. Is part of the problem in all of this too, Saul, the fact that somebody, a single individual, can set up down in his basement, put up a website that looks mm -hmm. super professional, That's right. uh, you know, boasts that he has more than a million membership, mm -hmm. when in reality it's one single person just spewing hatred? Well, in many cases, it's one single person, but in many other cases, it's a group of some kind. It's a political movement. And uh, you have to recognize that these are people who are uh, really intent on gaining power. They're not content simply to send out messages on the Internet. The Internet is for them is an instrument on the way to power. How do you feel about the CRTC's very recent decision not to censor the Internet? Well, I can understand it, but I also regret it. I think the CRTC lost a wonderful chance to create some order and sanity on the Internet and really muffed it. Uh, I think they were hesitant to do anything because there are so many voices out there that are saying, leave the Internet alone, you mustn't touch it, it's, you know, it's a growth industry, let it develop its full potential before we uh, take a second look at it. And uh, I don't think the CRTC was especially concerned with the question of hate on the Internet. I don't think they saw the things you have seen and will show on this show. Well, as a matter of fact, the Simon Wiesenthal Center has come out with Digital Hate 2000. That's right. It's a, it's a collective. You look at some of the different hate sites that are out there, uh, very informative. As a matter of fact, a picture is worth a thousand words. I think some of the pictures that we're going to see this afternoon, Saul, are worth more than 10,000. Let's roll that tape. We have taken, okay. and I think parents, as they're watching this video, w which just shows the different hate sites that are out there that you have put together with Digital Hate 2000, we have edited out the most offensive and obscene material. So this is just what we're seeing now this is just- the mild stuff. This is the mild stuff. This is what, you know, that you can actually watch on, yeah. on, uh, on television. So how concerned should parents be about this, given the fact that 
you know, their kids, the next time they log on the computer and start exploring cyberspace, this is some of the garbage they could be exposed to. Absolutely. And this is one of the reasons why we're so terribly concerned, especially because youngsters are, are vulnerable. They're, they're naive. They don't have the, sep the skepticism that adults have cultivated. Uh, they're very, very vulnerable to this kind of message. Well, the CRTC has said that the current laws regulating pornography or, or this proliferation or of hatred or other, you know, contentious material mm. are more than sufficient. But yet, these are sites that are up and running. So what does that say to you about well, the current laws? I think the CRTC was entirely wrong. Our, there's nothing wrong with our laws except there's nobody there to enforce them. Our experience with police officers, for example, we're now training police officers uh, initially. They've never had this training before. They didn't know how to use the Internet. Most, some of them didn't know how to turn on a computer. And after all, unless the police do the prosecuting, there's no one to, to make sure that the laws are enforced. How difficult is it? Let's say if, if there was a you know, police officer watching this program this afternoon, see some of this offensive material that is out there for anybody to access, even your children, and if it is violating the law, how difficult would it be you know, just to track these people down? Well, it's not difficult to track them down. Uh, the the so-called anonymity of the Internet is really a myth. Uh, we, uh, there are all kinds of techniques for tracking people down. If you think you're being uh, sly or sneaky on the Internet, forget it. We can, mm -hmm. uh, there are ways of tracking you down. But um, the, uh, the, the law is not necessarily the best way of approaching this. It, I think it's the extreme method. It's the final backup. Uh, I think there are all kinds of voluntary ways in which we could manage this. And incidentally, let me uh, argue with you about one term that you used. Mm -hmm. We're not interested in censoring the right. Internet. It is the government that does the censorship. I think there are many voluntary ways that we can do it that make sense that are far short of censorship. They may involve questions of editorship. For example, a newspaper doesn't publish every article that's sent to it. A newspaper doesn't publish every letter to the editor it receives. There are matters of taste, of policy, of decency and so on, which enter into the question of editorship. And I think that the providers, the group of people who, with whom you sign up when you develop uh, an email account, they're the people that uh, we have to approach. Well, Saul, some of the material that we have been watching, obviously, if I were to submit this, let's say, to the Toronto Star newspaper and ask them uh, you know, to run an ad on it, they, you know, they would refuse. They would my never ad. run it. Yeah. So why are we allowing this material to go out over the internet? Well, it's very interesting. I asked the same question of a friend of mine, uh, who is a, you know, very profound and and uh, un knowledgeable civil libertarian, and who was worried that you know our our campaign to try and come to terms with some of this stuff might end up in being censorship. I asked him whether he wanted to see it in the Toronto Star. And he said, Oh God, no. I said, well, do you want the CBC to run it? No. Then why on earth would you want to, see, want to see it on the Internet, which reaches even further than today's CBC and the Toronto Star? Why do you suppose, as a society, we are treating the Internet differently than we would any other medium? Well, that's an interesting story. <laughs> Let me give you my theory on it. I'm sure there are people who might argue with it. The Internet was initially... Um, uh, how shall I put it, developed by people who were essentially techies. These were people with a technical knowledge of, the, of computers and how they work and how the Internet would work. Uh, they had no social concerns, no social background. It was like taking a garage mechanic and asking him to uh, legislate, uh, you know, um, what, what should we call it, uh, the envi environmental laws. Uh, he, knows his, he knows the engine, but he really doesn't know anything about the social consequences of, of a, an internal combustion engine. So the techies were very, very uninterested. And of course, the clamor was that this is somehow a new medium. It's different from everything else. There should be different rules for it. And it really isn't that different. It relies on telephone lines primarily. It's capable of being controlled like any other medium we have. And the myth that it's uh, so ubiquitous, so widespread, so widely disseminated, that there's no way you can control it, is nonsense. 
because actually it is carefully funneled through a series of provincial pipelines to a federal pipeline and it would be controllable. Uh, you, you could turn the switch at any point along the, uh, the route. Um, but then came the, the question of uh, freedom of speech, freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of the people who uh, were most uh, loud in proclaiming the freedom of expression, well, they were of two types. There were people who sincerely believe in freedom of expression but don't realize that we're not in the United States, we're not applying American standards to the question of free speech. I think I brought with me a copy of our Canadian Constitution, and it says, you know, we guarantee you all, all the freedoms, but there's a but in it. And the but is, if it has bad social consequences, a civilized society may have to limit what you're doing. Uh, and I think it's a rather sensible approach, and most countries apply that approach. Uh, the other group that made a big noise were precisely the neo-fascists who would end everybody's freedom of speech on the day they first gained. Mm. And they're hiding and lurking behind the slogans of freedom of speech. And uh, they're using it very, very hypocritically. But they're very loud and boisterous in their cries. So we have these two groups that really opposed any uh, regulation of the Internet. And I think they are doing a disservice to a very valuable uh, instrument for communications that the Internet may self-destruct on, um, on its own accord because of some of the flaws in the Internet. Well, you mentioned the social impact. Yeah. And that's, you know, the asset test for any freedom, uh, what kind of social impact is going to happen. I want to talk to you more about that. Okay. First, we have to take a commercial break. Our phones are also are ringing off the hook. We're going to take some of your phone calls. We want to hear your views on this issue. Don't go away. We'll be back with more Rhonda London Live right after this. Welcome back to Rhonda London Live. Today the question we're asking is should the internet be censored? The CRTC has said no. The number to call 416-203-0302 or 905-332-3131. We're talking to Saul Littman, the Canadian representative of the Simon Wiesenthal Centre. Before we went to commercial break, you had talked about the acid test for the Constitution. My freedom of expression, my freedom of free speech ends when I start to perpetuate something that is socially damaging. And that's right. the acid test. What is the impact on society? How dangerous the hatred, the proliferation of hatred that you have uncovered with more than 2,000 hate sites worldwide, what damage is that causing? Well, we, we don't yet have a scientific study that tells us exactly what the impact of the Internet is, but there are certain indications. For example, you can look at the thing that happened in Littleton, Colorado, the Columbine High School, where two kids went in with guns and pipe bombs and uh, frankly massacred their, their own schoolmates. Uh, both of them were uh, very much involved on the Internet. Both of them uh, were posting on the Internet. And if you took a look at what they were really posting there, you found that uh, these kids who use shotguns, handguns, and handmade, homemade pipe bombs uh, were playing the, the, what was called the doom game. Uh, this is a very popular game, and in most cases I don't think it's terribly harmful to anybody, but they were playing it in a very grim and rather schizophrenic way. Uh, they were, for one thing, playing it in what's called the God mode. Uh, this means that uh, the, each player is, has the capacity to massacre any and all opponents, and he has the godlike quality of being immune to all counterattacks. Mm. And this is the way they did it. They smilingly shot down their schoolmates. Now, Harris and Keeble, the two kids in question, are, are exceptional cases. But there is an insidious subculture, which you've been showing uh, on your screens, uh, of racism and violence that is lurking there, waiting daily for millions of kids who spend a tremendous amount of time on the Internet. Uh, and part of it is wonderful, but some of it is very, very grim. I think that's what I find the most disturbing is many of these sites are geared simply towards young people. They are. We came across a crossword puzzle for kids. That's right. And The World Church of the Creator is, is one of the uh, organizations that we specifically have noted that is aiming its material at children. In the old days, they used to aim at late teenagers and young adults. 
That was the way in which the Klan recruited. Now they're going after youngsters. They're going after kids 8, 9, and 10 on the assumption that they're more vulnerable, they're uh, uh, more naive, and uh, more recruitable. And uh, they're using all kinds of devices to suck in these young kids. And also there are things lurking there. For example, th there's no question the internet is a great instrument for research and for f uh, digging up information. But as you dig up information, you sometimes get steered into alleys and back ways that you really shouldn't be going. For example, if you look up the word, uh, let's say your assignment is to do something on World War II on, on the Holocaust, and right. you look up the word Auschwitz, you might find a, uh, a list of sites which are essentially run by people who deny the Holocaust entirely. The, their form of, of Nazi propaganda is to deny the Holocaust. And they claim there are no concentration camps, no gas chambers, no final solutions, and so on. You might look up civil rights and go to do a piece on Martin Luther King and find that the World Church of the Creator has created a site in which two teenagers wearing World Church of the Creator t-shirts are peppering, uh, are, are uh, uh, shooting guns at Martin Luther King and the whole thing is a slander on, on King. Uh, so an innocent homework assignment has suddenly turned That's into right. something much more nefarious. And most parents have no idea what their kids are involved in. How could you supervise your child every moment of the day? And, and I mean, that might be realistic when they're younger, but it, you, when your child is 11 or 12 <laughs> or 13, yeah, and even then, I mean, you cannot be watching Most kids know a lot more about the computers than their, their parents do. Yeah, true. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, devices that they're trying to develop that will um, eliminate, will, will block mm -hmm. some of the bad stuff uh, really don't work because they're all based on, on what you call the key word system. Right. So, you know, if you use the word hate, for example, you don't have, you can avoid using the word hate. You can use another term for hate. You don't have to use the word Jews. You can use kikes and get around it that way. Uh, so those uh, techniques, those uh, uh, programs don't really work satisfactorily. The only way you can really deal with it is to keep this sort of stuff off the air, keep it off the internet. We and have to go to the phone, so our phones are absolutely go. ringing off the hook. Let's go to Jake on line eight. Go ahead, Jake. You are on the air. Yes, the decision doesn't make sense in as much as the governments, the provincial and municipal and federal governments, do involve censorship. Uh, tobacco companies cannot target minors. Alcoholic uh, companies cannot target minors in their advertisement. A 16-year-old can't walk in and buy a pack of cigarettes. A 16-year-old can't walk in and buy a bottle of beer. A 16-year-old can't buy a pornographic magazine. But a 16-year-old can click on the Internet and see pornographic vid uh, internet sites or hate sites it goes c even your TV program you you have censorship requirements on all TV stations oh, do I ever absolutely Jake. Well, this, this doesn't make any sense in as much as we have censorship laws on all in every level of government and to say the internet can't can't, can't have censorship flies against all the laws that we have to protect our youth Okay, Jake, thank you so much for your phone call. He brings up an interesting point because yes, the program yes. that people are watching this afternoon, this program is regulated by the CRTC. There That's are certain right. things I can say, certain things that I cannot say. That's right. Why would the Internet be, be different? And I should mention, too, censored is my word, not yours. That's right. Uh, I think the Internet has to be regulated. Uh, it's, it's pretty much the same way as when we first invented automobiles and uh, put them on roads with no stop signs and no signals and no uh, direction uh, indicators. Uh, there was chaos until we began having stop signs and stop lights and speed limits and so on. Uh, unless we regulate the Internet, it's going to self-destruct. Okay. We have some more pictures, too, and I really want to demonstrate to people exactly what we're talking about. So let's roll that video that we have. And these are just, it's just a small smattering of some of the 2,000 hate sites that are out there that any of your children could be, the next time they log on the computer, this is, this is what they could be seeing. They could be finding out how to get a nice tattoo that, you know, <laughs> that could last a lifetime. What is, how dangerous is this? Well, 
you know, the, the, I think one of the falsest things that our parents taught us was that sticks and stones will break our mm -hmm. bones, but names will never hurt us. The assumption being that as long as the thing is verbal, then it doesn't count, it doesn't matter. Uh, our experience indicates that, you know, if people hate, uh, continue to say they hate you, then eventually they're going to, this is a prelude to violence. Uh, it, there is no big separation between the hate word and the violent act. And I think over and over again, we've seen these kinds of hate groups descend into violence. Uh, the Oklahoma bombing is another example of it. The Columbine High School. Uh, there are, I think, about a dozen cases. This fellow Smith, who just, I think, two weeks ago, spent a weekend shooting up uh, blacks and Jews, whom he didn't even know. Uh, and uh, there is no, uh, if, the, the hotter the words become, the more likely they are to descend into violence. And this is, you know, heating up all the time. Okay, I want to talk to you more about that. I certainly want to take some more phone calls, but first okay. we have to take a commercial break. Don't go away. We'll be back with more Rhonda London Live. We want to hear from you. The question we're asking today, should the Internet be censored? The CRTC says the answer is no. Back to Rhonda London Live. Today we're talking about censorship on the Internet. The CRTC has said that the current laws that govern pornography or hatred or any other contentious material are sufficient to control the Internet. We're joined by Saul Littman, who is the Canadian representative of the Simon Wiesenthal Centre. Some of the material that we have seen today is extremely disturbing, uh, very obscene, very shocking. Are you ever successful in actually shutting these people down? Well, one of the things I'm pleased to report is that you're, finding, you're going to find fewer and fewer such sites emanating from Canada. One of the things that the Simon Wiesenthal Center has done here is we've approached the people who are the providers. These are the people that you sign up with when you first open up an email account. Um, and there, I think, are probably several hundred of them in Canada at the present time. And uh, we approach them, uh, first of all, as a group. Uh, the, they have an association called the Canadian Association of Internet Providers. And we suggested to them that they have a responsibility as an organization to deal with some of these problems. And fortunately, they were an enlightened bunch of people, and they said, yes, we think we do have some responsibility. We're going to study it. And uh, they are gradually working towards a, uh, a code of ethics that will govern everybody who is a member of their association. It will be voluntary, but it will probably be effective. And I know it will be effective because we've approached individual providers and said, look, you may not, you, you probably don't have time to monitor what's really on your site, on, on your service. So let us give you a few examples of who you've got there. Mm -hmm. And do you really want to see your business used to promote hate against Canada's minority groups? Do you really want to set one group of people against another in this country through your business? And most of them sort of, uh, well, they got shy, they got a little resistant, they uh, try to wiggle out. But in the end, almost everybody that we have approached said, no, you're right. You know, we really don't want that kind of thing. We don't want to take responsibility for that kind of thing. And of course, then there's the other question, which we didn't mention too much of. They may even have a legal liability if something mm -hmm. happens. If somebody, for example, some youngster gets killed as a result of some, youngster, some other youngster who watches something on their service, they may even find themselves legally responsible, um, legally liable in any event. Uh, so they have been gradually moving towards pulling the plug on these guys. It's just and they have, no, you know, they have no conscience on this. They have nothing to regret. And there's no, uh, there are no legal uh, repercussions. Our phones are ringing absolutely off the hook. Let's go to Chris on line one. Go ahead, Chris. You're on the air. Um, yeah, hello. Um, Hi, Chris. Go ahead. Okay, um, the CRTC is absolutely right when they say that the current laws are sufficient because those laws only apply to Canada, and the laws work fine, as we've seen so far, in getting sites in Canada closed down. But if, you, if I publish a site in, say, Amsterdam, the CRTC has no ability over it, no matter what they might like to think. So they're absolutely right. Okay, so I'll, get, I'll ask you to respond to that. But don't you have to start somewhere, though? Well, obviously you have to start somewhere, and Canada is a very good place to start. And the example that the CRTC might have set would have been very, very useful. The CRTC, simply by setting a few guidelines, 
has managed to avoid some of the major problems in broadcasting in this country. We've, I can't recall a time when we had a complaint against one of the uh, television stations or radio stations in Canada. I don't recall a time when we had a really major complaint against one of the newspapers or what have you. The press, the, the press councils do their job. CRTC does its job on broadcasting. Uh, the internet is dependent on telephone lines. The CRTC has jurisdiction over telephone lines. So that it would have been a very, very easy matter. There were some political reasons that um, prevented them from going ahead on this, but I think that this is a matter that they're going to reconsider probably within the next couple of years. Okay, let's go to Sam on line three. Go ahead, Sam. You're on the air. Uh, I just had a comment towards Saul. I just wanted to ask him if, if uh, attacking these white power sites, if he thinks people are actually going to find out the truth about what's going on. I'd honestly like to ask you, if you've been out on the street and you see what's going on, you see the racial tensions day by day, Okay, Sam, uh, thank What's you. What's his question? I'm not sure I understood He wants it. to know if you see the rent, uh, racial tension that is going on every single day. I think some of the material that we have seen today does, uh, is creating that, that racial tension. Absolutely. There, there are, uh, no one can deny that there are some racial tensions in Canada, although generally speaking we do much better than most other countries, and we're much more diverse than other countries. But certainly this kind of thing is not going to help reduce racial tensions. It's only going to aggravate it. It's only going to escalate it. So obviously we have to do as much as we possibly can to uh, limit the expressions of hate in order to avoid escalating hate expressions on the street. Okay, let's go to Don on line five. Go ahead, Don. You're on the air. Hi, how you doing? Hi, Don. Go ahead. You're on the air. Uh, what I was wondering about is if we start, like, I'm all for getting rid of, you know, hate sites and, and, you know, porn sites and stuff like that. But if we start censoring, you know, everybody and saying, well, this is offensive, let's get rid of it, you know, how far is it going to be until we start saying, until, you know, uh, a gay group will come out and say, yeah, well, you know, this Christian site that says homosexuality is wrong, uh, you know, that offends me. Let's take it off. Or, or you know, uh, a liberal political group will say, yeah, well, this site saying that, you know, workers should have more rights is communist. Let's take it off. And then, you know, everything's anesthetized and, you know, just wiped clean. And, you know, it's, you know, just basic rights are taken away. Okay, Don, thank you for your phone call. And he brings up some interesting points because it is always a balancing act. Right. My question is, though, the material that we have seen today, you know, that I have shared with my viewers, and again, this is the cleanest version. Uh, much of the material we couldn't put on television even just to demonstrate what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So if I can be regulated, if this show can be regulated, why not the Internet? Well, I, I try to explain that, um, you know, the, at first the, there was no interest and in, in initial resistance from the people who run the Internet. Uh, and then there were a group of people who um, uh, really enjoyed the anarchy of the thing. You know, these are the people who like to twist society's tail and make it yap as loud as it can. Mm -hmm. And here was a means of uh, getting, uh, reaching millions of people with no editors to uh, uh, limit you, uh, no bureaucracy to go through, no papers to file, no flight plan to announce and all the rest of it. And it seemed to them that this was a joyous kind of situation. It was like a kid, you know, going out in the rain and really stamping around in the puddles saying, isn't this great how dirty I'm getting. Uh, however, uh, that kind of uh, freedom ends at the point when it becomes dangerous. And we live in a society which inevitably involves rules and regulations. I can't walk into this studio and simply call you whatever I want to call you no matter, you know, uh, what motivation I might have. Uh, each of us has to be polite to the other. We have to obey the rules of the road. We can't build houses that go over our property line. Uh, our whole life as a civilized society depends on some sort of courtesy and some sort of rules and regulations. And the Internet is obviously not a separate instrument. It is a means of communication, very similar to any other means of communication. Uh, it, uh, it may be a form of broadcasting, it may be a form of publishing, it may be a form of something else. But whatever it is, it's regulatable and it needs regulation. Saul Littman, our time is gone, but thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We really My appreciate pleasure. it. Wonderful to be with you.
And don't go away. We're going to be back with more Rhonda London Live. Continue this discussion on censorship of the Internet, and we certainly want to take more of your phone calls. We'll be back right after this. Should the Internet be censored? That's the question we're asking today. With his thoughts on this discussion, we're joined by lawyer Paul McKeever, a spokesperson for the Freedom Party. Paul, thank Hi. you so much for joining us. Thank you. How do you answer that question? The CRTC has said that the Internet doesn't need to be censored. Censored is the word that I'm using, but sure. regulated uh, the same way that this show or, let's say, the Toronto Star newspaper is regulated. Uh, how do you feel about that decision? Well, it's probably the right one as far as I'm concerned, at least philosophically. Um, the Internet, first of all, I know that there are some uh, similarities between the Internet and TV and et cetera, but the, um, the Internet comes uh, packaged in this computer that provides you with so many tools to do some filtering of your own that in that sense, it's really a different uh, delivery mechanism than a TV is. How is that different from a television, though? The television has a wonderful delivery mechanism. Yeah. It, you know, the channel flipper. That's you don't right. ha I don't have to watch any channel. And, and in fact, for many, for many uh, types of content, I would agree that that's all that we, we need to have in terms of control. Uh, I would disagree with Saul in terms of the effectiveness of some of the uh, screening programs, though. And, and if there are uh, programs which lack the ability to properly screen certain offensive material, then certainly I would think the first step should be to improve the program rather than to say, we can't do it, let's just get rid of all of the material. Do you think, though, that, do you agree with Saul's statement that some of this material is so obscene, so graphic, uh, it's, it's just designed solely to incite hatred? Do you, think, do you agree with his contention that this is damaging to society? Because I have to tell you, Paul, when I was preparing for this interview, mm -hmm. and there are some 1,400 sites on this diskette, and looking at them, I was left with a profound sense of sadness. Right. Yeah, and I, I couldn't help but feel the same way looking at them in the green room. Um, certainly it's not my position that this is the kind of stuff I'd like to see. And I have two young children at home. I'd never want them to see this kind of crud, for lack of a better word. However, um, when we're talking about the um, uh, hate sort of content, as opposed to, for example, pornography and that kind of thing, what we're really talking about is whether or not we should allow certain messages to get out, certain false messages to get out. Now, when we're dealing with truth or falsity, there's a real problem mm -hmm. uh, in justifying censorship. And I'll, I'll explain. If you have something that's demonstrably false, then, of course, you don't need to censor it. Uh, you simply need to disprove it with the evidence which you have, which demonstrates that it's false. When you come across uh, another sort of argument that is um, thought to be false, but for which there is no hard evidence. I mean, there are legal cases every day are full of uh, situations where you don't have any paper, you just have someone's testimony. Where you have perhaps weaker evidence or no evidence, then we certainly don't want to censor the uh, information because it's more important then than ever that all sides of an argument are heard and the rational person can make a decision for him or herself as to what to believe and what not to believe. I'll, and I'll give you an example. I was uh, in the psychology department at University of Western Ontario back when Philippe Rushton was in trouble with uh, the RCMP over his uh, race uh, research. He was comparing all sorts of different characteristics for uh, one race versus another race or group as you want to call it. And he got in a lot of trouble. And at that time I remember uh, hearing reports from other uh, psych professors who were in the psychology department and finding that they would send their uh, students out to get various psychological reports, which had been ripped out of the various reporting journals, professional journals in the, in the university library. That is the sort of thing we cannot afford in society. We need to be able to evaluate all sorts of information, compare the good with the bad, and make, uh, make up uh, our own minds about what we can accept and what we can't accept. I certainly don't want to be in the position where my children have to be in the position where they have to just take as truth whatever the internet tells them. For example, if it had been filtered. I'd rather have all of the information there for them to make their decisions. I'll give you an example too. But I mean, how if can we, a 10 year old make a decision though? Yeah. Well, obviously. If the, they were to log into a site that's, say, denying the Holocaust, right. which is an important lesson for us all to learn because right. if you don't learn from the past, you're condemned to repeat it. Right. So let's say your 10 year old logs into a site that denies the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Is a 10 year old 
uh, philosophically and, and psychologically in a position to say, okay, uh, this I accept as truth or this I reject? Yeah. Certainly there's a role for the parent and I think I would be lacking as a parent if I didn't sit down at that point with my child when he comes to me and I hope I speak, I speak with him enough to know that he's seen that kind of information. If he sees that kind of information and I, I have an opportunity then to talk to him and I have to, I have to say to him, look, you've seen one particular bent on it I don't agree with that and I'll tell you why and I can then go to the various uh, bits of academic research there have been the various his historical reports and etc and show my child that this is actually propaganda that this is not true etc but it must be out there because my child shouldn't have to trust me any more than he should have to trust anyone else the information must be there so that whether he's 10 18 36 he will be able to make those choices rationally and convince himself as to the truth or falsity of something. Reliance upon authority is the worst thing that any rational and uh, advanced society can do because we've seen in the mm -hmm. past where, uh, you know, in the 1500s with the, um, the printing press and that kind of thing, there were worries that, you know, uh, people might start printing things like Jesus mm -hmm. was not the Son of God. Well, certainly we must be able to question things like that in a free society. But there is nothing rational or logical about the proliferation of hatred, some of the material that your 10-year-old uh, could be exposed to. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, does it disturb you at all, Paul, the fact that these hate groups, they are after your 10-year-old. There's right. games and crossword puzzles that are designed to entrap your mm -hmm. child. I'm not and happy with those people at all. And they're going for that gut reaction because there, oh, is, oh, yes. uh, there is nothing logical about racism. Right. And, but the same thing happens with cigarette ads and with also, I mean, I've, I've clicked on something that said improve your business and you click on improve your business and up comes a pornography site. Okay. So I, mm -hmm. I took the bait. Okay. Those kinds of things are going to happen. S certainly they're an annoyance. Uh, perhaps even uh, those people, if there are laws about, um, you know, whether children should have access to pornography, perhaps that's the route that should be taken. But um, if you're talking about adults, there is no justification in any, in any situation that I can see uh, to censor information with respect to the truth or falsity of anything. But why should I even be subjected to that? Even because, you know, I have made mistakes too when you're, mm -hmm. you're surfing the net, you're looking for information. Uh, a really current example, we are planning on doing a show, we want to do a show that explores how to discipline your children. Right. Uh, a lot of people don't agree with spanking. I put spanking, you know, pl plug it in, you know, uh, on my search engine, off we go, you won't believe what I saw. Sure. And I don't even want to be exposed to that, not even just for a second. Right. Why should I be? Right. Well, as we were discussing, I mean, I think Saul and I might disagree on the effectiveness of the software, but I mean, if you had software, which, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example also, I mean, you can um, click on a word, something like sex, and you might be looking for the sex of one animal with mm -hmm. another, and what you end up with is um, any number of sex sites. That's because these sites depend on keywords to be brought up in the search engines. Okay? You, p most people only look at the top 10 entries and they mm -hmm. go with those. So these sites frequently use keywords as many of, as they can that relate to their uh, topic to bring you to their site. Consequently, a, a program that looks for keywords, uh, when given a greater number of keywords, can filter out what you do want from what you don't want. Now, it's not going to be perfect, of course, but I mean, sometimes I see things on McLean, the cover of McLean's magazine which offend my, uh, my mm -hmm. beliefs. And I just, you know, a tolerant society is one which can tolerate a lot of things, very emotional things, very harmful in some ways to what you feel. But as long as they're not coming out and punching you in the face, then I think they're respecting your freedom. Okay, I want to talk to you about that. You brought up a good metaphor, but first we have to take a commercial break. Also, our phones are absolutely ringing off the hook. We're going to try to take more of your phone calls when we come back with more Rhonda London Live right after this. Welcome back to Rhonda London Live. Should the internet be censored? That's the question we're asking today. Paul McKeever, our phones are just absolutely ringing off the hook this afternoon. Let's go to our calls. Nikki is standing by very patiently, I might add, on line five. Go ahead, Nikki. You're on the air. Good afternoon. Hi, Nikki. Um, hi. What I'd like to say is, um, in my opinion, I think that there's too much censorship uh, in place in our society today. Um, the government has too much regulation. We have to understand that, you know, in a perfect world, we would have a perfect, for example, judicial system where we all know any rational individual would know that, you know, what the uh, justice system 
is implemented for is to send criminals to jail. But as we already know, there are some innocent people that have gone to jail, just like the Internet. It's not perfect. It's not a perfect system. Um, as far as children go, censorship should be in the home where um, there should be a, a, a trust between the uh, parent and the child where the adult can set the limits. And if uh, something does come along and uh, the child does see something that is completely inappropriate, then the uh, I'm going to uh, stop there, though, because you bring up an interesting point. If censorship should be up to the parents, uh, that's all fine and well, but mm -hmm. you cannot be with your child every minute of every day. And even if you're going to sit beside your child every second that they're on your personal computer at home, mm -hmm. there are computers in the library and, you know, even a, in a best case scenario, your child is out of sight probably eight to ten hours every single day. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, when I was a kid, it wasn't at all surprising <laughs> if some guy at the Boy Scout camp brought somebody's uh, nudie magazine. You know, it's going to happen that your child will see uh, pictures of people without clothes on, sometimes engaging in uh, acts that you might not approve of. I don't think that in those cases um, there's much we can do at all. Now, in terms of the cen uh, censorship issue on the Internet, as we say, there's, there is um, uh, content screening software available to parents, several different brands, which um, look at the textual content that does exist on uh, picture-oriented sites and uh, scans out, you know, mm -hmm. separates those bad sites out from the ones that you would like your children to see. Now, of course, there's always the kid at the camp with the magazine, and you will never get around that. But, but just because it's not a perfect world, should we not at least be striving for perfection? Striving per per for perfection should never involve tra uh, tromping on our uh, fundamental freedoms and rights. I mean, there has to be a line at which security of the person and safety gives way to uh, the freedom which is necessary for, uh, for rational uh, discourse. But the old metaphor, though, Paul, my right to swing my arms, I have a right to swing my arms, but that ends where your face begins. That's correct. And, and photographs and words have never struck a face. But, you know, some of the garbage that we have seen this afternoon is literally polluting the minds of young Canadians. Mm -hmm. And that's... Our kids. Yeah. And I think it's very important that we as adults and we as parents make sure that with every bit of pollution, there's a little bit of scrubbing that goes along. You know, we need to get in there and, and explain to our children that if there's an act that we didn't like them seeing on, on the Internet, we explain why perhaps that's a portrayal of something that's not common or not normal. Um, if there is a uh, bit of information there that's, uh, if taken to heart, would, be, um, would lead to um, unacceptable or even criminal behavior, we, are, we as parents need to sit down with our children and explain that some things are just uh, not acceptable and not going to be tolerated in so society. But, but adults are also reading that content. We can't forget that. Rational adults who can make uh, distinctions between right and wrong, between fact and fiction, uh, should be able to do so. See, I find very little rational about some of the material that we've seen this afternoon. Let's go to Kevin on line seven. Go ahead, Kevin. You're on the air. Yes, hi. Um, you guys have been uh, touching upon the, you know, the censorship part uh, in regards to the the the, the, the parents, uh, you know, taking a more active role in uh, in in you know watching what the, their kids are looking at. Um, but I think, uh, you know, and in the question, should the internet be censored? Yes, I believe it should. Uh, can it be censored? Uh, I don't think it can. It's just too too large of an entity that uh, that that it can be censored. But uh, but what parents can do themselves is 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 uh, you know make sure they're there to see what's going on on, on the the computer. But I think it's also the responsibility of the providers to be able to provide some software that you know that they include along with not just the package to get their computers hooked up but say you know here's the sensitive uh, censorship package you know and uh, i think it's the responsibility of the providers to do that okay kevin thank you very much for your phone call we appreciate your comments this might be a good time a gentleman that we talked to on this show a few months ago has created it's a, literally a separate internet and it's a program it's called uh, my father's eyes and basically what they do is they have people that will screen every single site mm -hmm. and if it's approved if it meets their criteria they will add it to their internet so it's literally a separate internet so that's a way there's no way that you could plug in a keyword let's say right. sex and find anything that hasn't been pre-approved and, and certainly i think we should all exercise our freedoms to start as many different groups as we want and and um, 
I mean, that's, that's not an abridgment of our freedom for someone to choose to operate such a site or for a service, internet service provider to volunteer not to host certain content. I think we have to draw the line, though, uh, when we say, look, you're renting a megaphone to this guy, so when he says something in a crowd 100 miles away that we don't approve of, you're the one that's going to get in trouble. I don't think we can make that step. Okay, we have to take a commercial break, but don't go away. We'll be back with more Rhonda London Live. We'll hear more from Paul McKeever. We're back right after these messages. Stay tuned. Absolutely out of time. Just in a few seconds, your thoughts on the fact that the CRTC is not going to censor the internet. You see that as a positive step forward, a negative? It's, it's a non-step, but I think it's an appropriate non-step. Um, the internet is actually, in my view, a model of what ought to be, not a model that has to be altered. Okay, Paul McKeever, thank you. Thank you. And that's our show for today. I'll be back here again tomorrow. Hope you'll join us. In the meantime, have a great afternoon.